Hi everyone and welcome back to a very special edition of the Sex Advent Calendar. You didn't know you were getting a bonus episode. The thing I realized when uh, we recorded the initial segment on this topic was that it's really important to have people who identify with a disability speak for themselves and their own experiences, and we didn't have that for talking about intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I am really delighted to have Meredith here. She is a brilliant um, scholar and student and activist and has a lot of wonderful things to share with us. So I'm going to turn it over to her to do her own introduction. So my name is Meredith Nicholson. I am a master's student at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. My main research interest is sexual and reproductive health care access for people with disabilities. Um, for me, it's a it's a really personal issue. Um, I'm autistic and live with other disabilities as well. Um, and I'm also a member of the LGBT community too. Um, you know, even growing up, um, I never was asked about whether I was sexually active, if I was um, in need of any birth control methods. And so I think a lot of the work is just trying to ensure that providers treat us with folks who have the same desires as able-bodied people do. There's the assumption that we are not sexually active, that we are not you know, in sexual and or romantic relationships because who would love people like us. That bias definitely comes out in the exam room. Again, I, um, I didn't have my first OBGYN appointment until I had a chronic issue that I needed to see an OBGYN for. And when they had asked how long I was sexually active for, they were shocked I'd never gone to an OBGYN before. And I was just like, well, no one ever told me, no one ever asked me. And I consider myself to be a smart person, but none of my providers ever asked me, you know, was I sexually active, much less what are my needs? Um, in the arena of sexual and reproductive health care. I think a lot of well-meaning folks who are who are able-bodied, who are neurotypical, um, and care about sexual and reproductive health care access for people with disabilities tend to frame things in the context of how um, folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities, we have such disproportionate rates of sexual assault, and that's why um, we deserve comprehensive sex education. Now, of course, everybody should learn what sexual assault looks like um, and how it differs from kind of um, conventional notions that a lot of times it's people that we know, that it's more subtle coercion, like, for instance, saying that um, no can be a yes in disguise. And even with higher sexual assault rates as folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities, we need to be seen as more than just passive victims. Um, you know, we deserve to, you know, have access to education that just like able-bodied people is relationship-based instead of pathology-based. Um, there's some really great work, for instance, the sexual health equity for intellectual, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, from the Oregon um, Health and Sciences University and also um, the friendships and dating curriculum from the University of Alaska are really great examples of that, you know, for instance, I was speaking with, um, her name is Perrin Reese from Health Connected, which is a nonprofit in California that does sex ed, including a wonderful curriculum for people with disabilities that is forthcoming. And, you know, she mentioned the point that a lot of times sex ed for people with disabilities is molestation and copulation, but we deserve so much more than that. So again, so much of it is just getting providers to push through their unconscious biases, um, you know, instead of making assumptions. I um, mean, for folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities to make sure that you present material in an accessible way, having info that's plain language or alternative formats. So sometimes folks with developmental intellectual disabilities might need kind of more picture-based materials or the like. Um, and also a really important thing, as I mentioned, um, I'm bisexual and there are LGBTQ disabled people too. We shouldn't be all assumed to be heterosexual, to be all cisgender. In fact, autistic people are more likely 
than folks who are neurotypical to identify as LGBT. Um, and then do you have advice for what that communication and support looks like outside of a healthcare context, like in our interpersonal relationships? Definitely. Um, so autistics and other people with developmental and intellectual disabilities communicate differently. That may be verbal, that may be nonverbal. It may take us longer to process something. We may use augmentative alternative communication devices and also sensory needs. So, you know, a light touch versus a firm touch may be too much for someone or being touched at all. Um, whether that's a given day, whether that's most days can be really difficult for for folks, especially who are autistic like myself. Um, I think something else that's really important, especially if one is talking about consent, um, I definitely agree that consent should be made in a clear way. And I think that it's important to note that consent may not always be made in a verbal way. Um, I see a lot of really well-meaning resources like learning good consent, you know, as comprehensive as those are, they still assume that everybody, you know, communicates verbally all the time, that people are gonna be able to process things right away. And so something that I, I would really like to see from sex educators when they talk about consent in order to be inclusive of folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities is to stress what does consent look like for you individually and challenge those assumptions so that everybody can communicate to their partners about what consent looks like for them or what lack of consent looks like for them, um, whether that's explicitly verbal or expressed in a different way. Oh, I think that's so valuable, especially because I think there's the assumption that people who communicate differently um, just aren't able to express their needs or preferences around touch or around intimacy or anything. Um, but we probably need to reframe it to where we know how to listen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there, the, the way that we kind of talk, think about it in the autistic community is that if you expect us to communicate in neurotypical ways, then it's, it's pretty akin to, assuming that someone is going to speak your language and and since we don't do that if there is the assumption when asking for consent or giving consent that you know we speak that same language if you will then of course it's going to be unpleasant and confusing for all parties involved so you're absolutely right that you know just because we you know don't speak the language of neurotypicals, if you will, it doesn't mean that we don't have anything to say, and it doesn't mean that we can't be active agents in consenting or non-consenting to sexual activity. Any closing thoughts on just the general topic of sex and intellectual and developmental disabilities? Yeah, it's really important to include people with disabilities in your work. There are different curriculum out there that um, are meant to be facilitated by someone with a disability. Planned Parenthood of New England has one. I know that it's meant to be facilitated by people with disabilities. Um, so whenever possible, you know, include people with disabilities, not just as passive recipients of your, of your sex education, of your, um, of your medical um, expertise, but um, include us in your efforts to facilitate and also be sure to um, when we when we give you feedback to to take us seriously a lot of times um, especially among um, folks who claim to be speaking for autistics they you know instead of really listening to us when we call them out call them in they just tend to shut us down and dismiss us when um, we should be centered first and foremost Thank you so much, Meredith, for sharing that with us. I think you did an incredible job adding more depth and nuance to the conversation about what it means to address sexual health for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So thank you for taking your time to be here. Thank you to everyone for listening in. I hope you are having a wonderful new year. And as always, if you are interested in more sexual health information, you can check out my store, store.intimatehealthconsulting.com and take a look, see what webinars or live in-person trainings might benefit you and your um, colleagues. Thanks so much and take, have a great day.